Rancé, Chapter 18 of Shardick by Richard Adams On the edge of the forest, Rancé knelt over the tracks showing faintly in the hard ground. They led westward into the thick undergrowth, and where they disappeared, the bark of a kelmet tree had been slashed white, high up by the bear's claws. She knew that it was not two hours since Shardick had deliberately lain in wait for and killed a man. In this mood, he might well kill again might lie in wait for those who tracked him, or steal, elusive and silent, through the woods until he was behind them and the pursuers became the pursued. The strain of the past month had told increasingly upon the priestess. She was the oldest of the women who had followed Shardik down or Telga and across the Telferna Strait, and though her belief in his divine power was untouched by the least doubt, she had felt also, more and more as the days went by, the hardship of the life, and the continual fear of death. The young risk their lives heedlessly, often actually for sport, but their elders, even while they may grow in humility and selflessness, grow also in prudence and in regard for their own lives, those little portions of time in which they hope to create something fit to be offered at last to God. Rancé, novice mistress and warden of the ledges, had not, like Malathus, been caught unawares by the sudden coming of Shardik, like a thief in the night. From the moment when the Tuginda's message had reached Kiso, she had known what would be required of her. Since then, day after day, she had been driving her gaunt and aging body over the rocky hillsides and through the thickets of the island, struggling with her own fear even while she calmed some near-hysterical girl and persuaded her to take part once more in the singing, or herself took the girl's place and felt yet again the slow response of her muscles to the bear's lithe, unpredictable movements. On Kiso, Anthred, the woman struck down and killed among the trees by the shore, had been first her servant, then her pupil, and finally her closest friend. Once, in a dream, she had embraced her as her own child, and together they had dug up and burned that day in the rains, long ago, when Rancé's disappointed father— frightened at last by her waking fits, her swoons, and her voices that spoke and babbled from her at these times, had gone to the high baron to offer the, to the ledges his ugly, unmarriageable tent-pole of a daughter. She had recalled the dream as she performed the traditional rite of burning Anthrid's quiver, bow, and wooden rings upon her grave by the Telferna Strait. By what means was Shardick to be brought into the open and drugged insensible? And if the means she chose were faulty— how many lives would be lost with nothing to show? She returned to the girls, who were standing together a little way off, looking into the valley. When did he last eat? No one has seen him eat, madame, since he left Ortelga yesterday morning. Then he is likely to be looking for food now. The Tuginda and Lord Keldrek say he is to be drugged. Can we not follow him, madame, said Nito, and put down meat or fish with tessic hidden in it? Lord Keldrek says he must not fall asleep in the thick forest. If it can be accomplished, he is to return here. He will hardly return here, madame, said Nito, nodding her head towards the road below. At the foot of the slope, fires were already burning, and the sounds came up of many men at work, sudden cries of urgency or warning, the flat ringing of a hammer on iron, the gushing of flames fanned by a bellows, the rasp of a saw, the tap-tap-tap of a mallet and chisel. They could see Keldarek going from one group to another, conferring, pointing, nodding his head while he talked. As they watched, Sheldra left his side and came climbing quickly towards them. Impassive as usual, she showed no excitement or breathlessness as she stood before Rancé and raised her palm to her forehead. Lord Keldarek asks whether Shardik has yet gone far and what is to be done. He may well ask, and he a hunter— does he think Shardick is likely to stay near that stinking smoke and tumult? Lord Keldrek has ordered that some goats should be driven higher up the valley and tethered on the edge of the forest. He hopes that if Lord Shardick can be prevented from hunting or feeding elsewhere, he may perhaps make his way towards them, and that you may find means, madame, to drug him there. Go back and tell Lord Keldrek that if it can be done, we will find a way to do it with God's help. Zilfi, Nito, go back to the camp and... Bring up what meat you can find, and all the tessic that is there, the green leaves as well as the dried powder. And you are to bring the other drug, too, the Teltokarna. 
"'But Totokarna can be administered only in a wound, madame, and not in food. "'It must be mingled with the blood.' "'I know that as well as you,' snapped Renze, "'and I have already told you to bring it. "'There are six or seven gallbladders packed with moss in a wooden box with a sealed lid. "'Handle it carefully. The bladders must not be broken. "'I will send back one of the other girls to meet you here "'and bring you on to join us, wherever we may be.' The long and dangerous search for Shardik, westward through the forest, continued until afternoon, and when, at last, Zilthi came running between the trees to say that she had caught sight of the bear prowling along the bank of a stream not far away, Rance already felt herself on the point of collapse from strain and fatigue. She followed the girl slowly through a grove of myrtles and out into an expanse of tall yellow grass buzzing with insects in the sun. Here Zilthi pointed to the bank of the stream. Shardik gave no sign that he had seen them. He was fishing, splashing in and out of the water, and every now and then scooping out a fish to flap and jump on the stony bank before he held it down and ate it in two or three bites. Watching him, Rance's heart sank. To approach him was more than she dared attempt. The girls, she knew, would not refuse to obey her if she ordered them to do it. But what end would it serve? Suppose they could somehow succeed in startling him from the brook— what then? How were they to drive or entice him to return in the direction from which he had come? She went back to the trees and lay prone, her chin propped in her hands. The girls, gathering about her, waited for her to speak, but she said nothing. The shadows moved over the ground before her eyes, and the flies settled at the corners of her mouth. The heat was intense, but she gave no sign of discomfort, only now and then standing up to look at the bear, and then lying down as before. At length, Shardik left the stream and stretched himself out in a patch of great hemlock plants, not far from where the priestess was lying. She could hear the hollow sound of the stems as they snapped, and see the white umbels of bloom toppling and falling as the bear rolled among them. The silence returned and with it the weight of her impossible task and the agony of her determination. In her perplexed exhaustion she thought with envy of her friend, free at last from every burden, from the laborious dedication of the ledges and the continual fatigue and fear of the last weeks. If one had power to change the past, it was a favorite fantasy with her, though one which she had never shared, even with Anthrid. If she had power to change the past, at what point would she enter it to do so? At that night on the beach of Kiso a month ago, this time she would not guide them inland, but turn them back, the night messengers, the heralds of Shardik. It was dark. It was night. She and Anthred were standing once more on the stony beach with the flat green lantern between them, splashing the shallow water with their staves. Go back! she cried into the darkness. Go back! Return whence you came! You should never have come here! Ah, yes, I myself am the voice of God, and that is the message I am sent to deliver to you! She felt Anthred clutch at her arm, but pushed her aside. The windless, moonless darkness was thick about them. Only the sky retained a faint trace of light. Something was approaching, splashing slowly and heavily towards the shore. A huge black shape loomed above her, its lowered head turning from side to side, the mouth open, the breath floated and rank. She faced it imperiously. Once she and it had gone their several rays, then, ah, she would return with Anthred to find her girlhood, to turn its course away from Kiso forever. She raised her arm and was about to speak again, but the presence, with a soft, shaggy slapping of wet feet on the shore, passed by her and was gone into the wooded island. There was a blinding light and a noise of scolding birds. Rance looked about her in bewilderment. She was standing knee-deep in the dry, tawny grass. The sun was thinly covered with a fleece of cloud, and suddenly a long, distant roll of thunder ran round the edge of the sky. Some insect had stung her on the neck, and her fingers, as she drew them across the place, came away smeared with blood. She was alone. Anthred was dead, and she herself was standing in the dried-up, bitter forest south of the Telferna. The tears flowed silently down her haggard, dusty face as she bent forward, supporting herself upon her staff. After a few moments, she bit hard upon her hand, drew herself up, and gazed about her. 
Some distance away, Nito looked out from among the trees and then approached, staring at her incredulously. "'Madame, what? The bear? What have you done? Are you unharmed? Wait, lean on me. I—' "'Oh, I was afraid. I am so much afraid.' "'The bear,' said Rancé. "'Where's the bear?' As she spoke, she noticed for the first time a broad path flattened through the grass beside her, and on it, here and there, the tracks of shardic, broader than roof tiles. She bent down. The smell of the bear was plain. It could have passed only since she had last seen it among the hemlocks. Dazed, she raised her hands to her face and was about to ask Nito what had happened when she became conscious of yet one more bodily affliction. Her tears fell again. Tears of shame and degradation. Nito, I... I am going down to the stream. Go tell the girls to follow Lord Shardick at once. Then wait for me here. You and I will overtake them. In the water she stripped and washed her body and fouled clothes as well as she could. On Kiso it had been easier. Often Anthred had been able to perceive when one of her fits was coming on and had contrived to help her to save her dignity and authority. Now there was not one of the girls whom she could think of as her friend. Looking back, she caught a glimpse of Nito loitering discreetly among the trees. She would know what had happened, of course, and tell others. They must not be too long in catching up. Left to themselves, the girls would not be steady, and if by some incredible stroke of fortune Shardick were indeed to return whence he had come, nevertheless without herself they could not be relied upon to do their utmost, to death if necessary, to carry out the Duginda's instructions. She and Nito had not gone far when she realized that the fit had left her dulled and stupefied. She longed to rest. Perhaps, she thought, Shardick would stop or turn aside before the evening, and Lord Keldrek would be forced to allow them another day. But each time they came up with one or other of the girls waiting to show them the direction, the news was that the bear was still wandering slowly southeastward, as though making for the hill country below Gelt. Evening came on. Rancé's pace had become a limping hobble from one tree trunk to the next, yet still she exhorted Nito to keep her eyes open, to make sure of the right way forward, and to call from time to time in hope of hearing a reply from ahead. Vaguely, she was aware of twilight, of the fall of darkness, and later of moonlight among the trees, of intermittent thunder far off, and of swift momentary gusts of wind. Once she saw Anthred standing among the trees and was about to speak to her when her friend smiled, laid a ringed finger to her lips, and disappeared. At last, in the clear moonlight, at some mid-hour of the night, she looked about her and realized she had caught up with the girls. They were standing close together, in a whispering group, but as she approached, leaning on Nito's arm, they all turned towards her and fell silent. To her, their silence seemed full of dislike and resentment. If she had hoped for comradeship or sympathy at the end of this bitter journey, she was clearly to be disappointed. Handing her staff to Nito, she drew herself up, almost crying out as she put her full weight upon the broken blistered soles of her feet. "'Where's Lord Shardick?' "'Close at hand, madame. Not a bow shot away. He has been sleeping since moonrise.' "'Who is that?' said Rancé, appearing. "'Sheldra, I thought you were with Lord Keldrek. How do you come to be here? Where are we?' We are a little higher up the valley that you left this morning, madame, and on the edge of the forest. Zilthi came down to the camp to tell Lord Keldorek that Shardick had returned, but she was exhausted, so he sent me back instead of her. He says that Lord Shardick must be drugged tonight. Has any attempt been made to drug him? No one replied. Well? We have done all we could, madame, said another of the girls. We prepared two haunches of meat with Tessic and placed them as close to him as we dared— but he would not touch them. There is no more Tessic. We can only wait until he wakes. Before I left Lord Kelderick, madame, said Sheldra, a messenger arrived from Gelt, from Lord Tuckermunion. He sent word that he expected to fight the day after tomorrow, and that Shardick must come no matter what the cost. His words were, The hours now are more precious than stars. From the hills to southward the lightning flickered between the trees. Rancé limped the few yards to the edge of the forest and looked out across the valley. The sound of the brook below wavered on the air. Away to her left she could see the fires of the camp where the Tuginda and Keldrek must at this moment be waiting for news. She thought of the black shape that had passed her in the noonday night, 
through the watery shallows of the grass, and of Anthred smiling among the trees, her hands adorned with the plated rings that she herself had burned by the shore. These signs were clear enough. The situation was, in fact, a simple one. All that was required was a priestess who knew her duty and was capable of carrying it out with resolution. She returned to the girls. They drew back from her, staring silently in the dimness. You say Lord Shardick is close at hand. Where? Someone pointed. Go and make sure that he is still sleeping, said Ransay. You should not have left him unwatched. You are all to blame. Madame. Be silent, said Ransay. Nito, bring me the box of Thetulkarna. She drew her knife and tested it. The sharp edge sliced lightly through a leaf held between her finger and thumb, while the point, with the least pressure upon it, almost pierced the skin of her wrist. Nito was standing before her with the wooden box. Rance stared coldly down at the girl's trembling fingers, and then at the knife held motionless in her own steady hand. Come with me. You too, Sheldra. She took the box. She remembered the last time that she and Anthred had walked through fire in the courtyard of the Upper Temple, on the night when they had led Keldrek to the Bridge of the Suppliants. There was an unreality about the memory, as though it were not hers but some other woman's. The night sound seemed magnified about her. The dry forest echoed through caves of dripping water, and her body felt like a mass of hot sand. These were symptoms she recognized. She would need to be quick. Her fear was somewhere behind her, searching for her, overtaking her among the trees. The bear was stretched on its side in a thicket of chinchillada saplings, two of which he had pushed down and snapped in making a place to sleep. A few feet away lay one of the haunches of meat. Whoever had put it there had not lacked courage. The huge mass of the body was dappled with moonlight and leaf shadows. The shaggy flank rising and falling in sleep, and overlaid with the speckled moving light, appeared like a dark plain of grass. Before the half-open, breathing mouth, the leaves on one of the broken branches stirred and glistened. The claws of one extended forepaw were curved upward. Rance stood a few moments, gazing as though at a deep, swift river into which she must now plunge and drown. Then, motioning the girls away, she stepped forward. She was standing against the ridge of Shardik's back, looking over his body, as though from behind an earthwork, at the restless, wind-moved forest. The thunder muttered in the hills, and Shardik stirred, twitched one ear, and then once more lay still. Rance thrust her left hand deep into the pelt. She could not lay bare the skin, and began cutting away the oily hair, matted and full of parasites as a sheep's fleece. Her own hands were trembling now, and she worked faster, lifting each handful carefully, cutting, and then drawing it away from under the sharp knife. Soon she had cut a wide, bristling patch across the shoulder, almost bearing the grey, salt-flake skin. Two or three veins ran across it, one thick enough to reveal the slow beating of the pulse. Rance turned and stooped for the box beside her. Taking out two of the little oiled bladders, she placed them between the fingertips of her left hand. Then she drove the point of the knife into the bear's shoulder and drew the blade back towards her, opening a gash half as long as her own forearm. Smoothly, without a pause, she pushed the bladders into it, drew the edges of the incision over them, pressed downwards, and felt them crush inside. With a snarl, Shardik threw back his head and rose upon his hind legs. Rance flung to the ground, got up and stood facing him. For a moment it seemed that he would strike her down. Then, lurching forward, he crushed her against his body. A few steps he carried her, hanging grotesquely in his grip. Then, letting her drop, limp as an old garment fallen from a line, he staggered out to the open slope beyond the trees. He rolled on the ground and froth flew from his mouth as he bit and tore at the grass. Sheldra was the first to reach the priestess. Her left hand had been gashed by her own knife, her tongue protruded, and her head lay grotesquely upon her shoulder like that of a hanged man. When Sheldra put one arm beneath her and tried to raise her, a terrible crackling sound came from the broken body. The girl laid her back, and for a moment she opened her eyes. Till the Tuginda did what she said, 
blood gushed from her mouth, and when it ceased, her gaunt, bony body vibrated very lightly, like the surface of a pool fluttered by the wings of a trapped fly. The movement ceased, and Sheldra, perceiving that she was dead, drew off her wooden rings, picked up the box of Theltokana and the fallen knife, and made her way out to the slope, where Shardik lay insensible. Night Messengers, Chapter 19 of Shardik by Richard Adams The cage had taken all day to complete, if complete it were. On hearing his orders, Baltus, the master smith, had shrugged his shoulders, making light of Keldrek, whom he had heard of as a simple young fellow with neither family, wealth, nor craft, for in his eyes hunters were not craftsmen. He and his men, being armed with excellent weapons of their own making, had supposed that they were about to play their part in the sack of Bekla, or at any rate, the sack of Gelt, and took it ill to be called out of the march and put back on their accustomed work. Keldrek, having tried in vain to bring home to the great lumbering fellow the vital importance of what he had to do, went back to Tacominion, catching him just as he was about to set out with the advance guard. Tacominion, cursing with impatience, summoned Baltus to him under the tree which bore the body of Fessel Hasta, and promised him that if the cage were not complete by nightfall, he should hang like the baron. This was talk that Baltus could understand clearly enough, and he immediately asked for double the number of men he expected to get. Tacominion, being in too much haste to argue, allowed him fifty, including two rope-makers, three wheelwrights, and five carpenters. As the army wound away up the valley in the thickening, sultry morning, Keldrek and Baltus fell to their work. Messengers were sent back to Artelga, and before midday all the stored fuel on the island, much of its stock of sawn timber, and every piece of forged iron had been carried up to the camp by women and boys. The iron was of different lengths and thicknesses, much of it too short to be of use except as pieces for welding. Baltus set his men to make three axles and as many iron bars as possible, the latter to be of equal length and thickness, pointed and pierced at both ends. Meanwhile, the carpenters and wheelwrights, using seasoned wood, some of which had until that morning formed part of the walls, roofs, and tables of Ortelga, built a heavy platform of strutted planks, which they raised with levers and mounted upon six spokeless wheels, solid wood to the rims. By evening, Baltus's men had forged, welded, or cut sixty bars, disparate, rough-edged things, yet serviceable enough to be driven point-first through the holes drilled round the edges of the platform, and then secured with iron pins. "'The roof will have to be wooden, too,' said Baltus, looking at the poles sticking up out of the planks and pointing this way and that like a bed of reeds. There's no more iron, young man, and none to be had, so no use to fret over it. A wooden roof will shake to pieces, said the master carpenter. It'll not hold the bear, not if he goes to break it. It's not work to be done in a day, growled Baltus. No, not in three days. A cage to hold a bear? I was the first to see Lord Shardick come ashore yesterday morning, barring that poor devil Lucan and his mate. How's the bear to be brought to the cage? interrupted the carpenter. Ah, that's more than we know. You are here to obey Lord Tocominion, said Keldrick. It is the will of God that Lord Shardick is to conquer Bekla, and that you will see with your own eyes. Make the roof of wood if it must be so, and bind the whole cage round with rope, twisted tight. The work was finished at last by torchlight, and Keldrek, when he had dismissed the man to eat, remained alone with Sheldra and Elith, peering and probing, kicking at the wheels, fingering the axle pins, and finally testing each of the six bars set aside to close the still open end. How is he to be released, my lord? asked Elith. Is there to be no door? The time is too short to make a door, answered Keldrek. When the hour comes to release him, we will be shown the way. He must be kept drugged, my lord, as long as possible, said Sheldra, for neither that nor any other cage will hold Lord Shardick if he is minded otherwise. I know it, said Keldrek. We might as well have made a cart to put him in. If only we knew where he is. He broke off as Zilfi came limping into the torchlight, raised her palm to her forehead, and at once sank to the ground. Forgive me, lord, she said, drawing her bow from her shoulder and laying it beside her. We have been following Lord Shardick all day, and I am exhausted, with fear even more than with fatigue. He went far. Where is he? interrupted Keldrek. 
My lord, he is sleeping on the edge of the forest, not an hour from here. God be praised, cried Kelderek, clapping his hands together. I knew it was his will. It was Rancé, my lord, who brought him back, said the girl, staring up at Kelderek as though even now afraid. We came upon him at noon, fishing in a stream. He lay down near the bank, and we dared not approach him. But after a long time, when it seemed that there was nothing to be done, Rancé, without telling us what she intended, suddenly stood up and went out into the open where Lord Shardick could see her. She called him. My lord, as I live, she called him, and he came to her. We all fled in terror, but she spoke to him in a strange and dreadful voice, rebuking him and telling him to return, for he should never have come so far, she said. And Shardick obeyed her, my lord. He passed by her where she stood. He made his way back at her command. God's will, indeed, said Kildrek with awe. And all that we have done is right. Where is Rancé now? I do not know, my lord, said Zulfi, almost weeping. Nito told us we were to follow Lord Shardick and that Rancé would overtake us, but she did not, and it is many hours now since we last saw her. Kelderek was about to send Sheldra up the valley when a challenge and answer sounded from further up along the road. After a pause, they heard footsteps and Numis appeared. He, too, was exhausted and did not ask Kelderek for leave to sit before flinging himself to the ground. "'I've come from beyond guilt,' he said. "'We took guilt easy, set it on fire. "'Not much fighting, but we killed the chief, "'and after that the rest of them were willing enough "'to do what Lord Tuckleminion told him. "'He talked to some of them alone, "'and I dare say he asked them what they knew about Bekla, "'how to get there and all the rest of it. "'Anyway, whatever it was. "'If he gave you a message, tell me that,' said Kelderek sharply. "'Never mind what you heard or suppose. "'This is the message, sir. "'I expect to fight the day after tomorrow. "'The rains can be no later.' and now the hours are more precious than stars. Bring Lord Shardick, no matter what the cost. Kelderek jumped up and began pacing to and fro beside the cage, biting his lip and smiting his clenched fists into his palm. At length, recovering himself, he told Sheldra to go and find Rancé, and if Shardick had been drugged, to bring back word at once. Then, fetching some brands to start a fire, he sat down by the cage, with Numis and the two girls, to wait for news. None spoke, but every now and again Kelderek would look up, frowning, to mark the slow time from the wheeling stars. When at last Zilfi started and laid a hand on his arm, he had heard nothing. He turned to meet her eyes, and she stared back at him, holding her breath, her face half firelit, half in shadow. He too listened, but could hear only the flames, the fitful wind, and a man coughing somewhere in the camp behind them. He shook his head, but she nodded sharply, stood up, and motioned him to follow her along the road. Watched by Nilith and Numis, they set off into the darkness, but had gone only a little way when she stopped, cupped her hands, and called, "'Who's there?' The reply, Nito, was faint but clear enough. A few moments later, Keldrek caught at last the girl's light tread and went forward to meet her. It was plain that in her haste and agitation she had fallen, perhaps more than once. She was begrimed, disheveled, and grazed across the knees in one forearm. Her breath came in sobs, and they could see the tears on her cheeks. He called to Numis, and together they supported her as far as the fire. The camp was astir. Somehow the men had guessed that news was at hand. Several were already waiting beside the cage, and one spread his cloak for the girl across a pile of leftover planks, brought a pitcher, and knelt down to wash her bleeding grazes. At the touch of the cold water she winced, and as though recalled to herself, began speaking to Kelderek. Shardick is lying insensible, my lord, not a bowshot from the road. He has been drugged with Feltokarna, enough to kill a strong man. God knows when he will wake. With Feltokarna? asked Nilith incredulously. But Nito began to weep again. And Rancé is dead, dead. Have you told Lord Keldrek how she spoke to Shardick beside the stream? Zilthi nodded, staring aghast. When Shardick had passed her and gone, she stood for a time stricken, it seemed, as though, like a tree, she had called lightning down to her. Then we were alone, she and I, following the others as best we could. I could tell... I could tell that she meant to die, that she was determined to die. I tried to make her rest, but she refused. It is not two hours since we returned at last to the edge of the forest. 
All the girls could see her death upon her. It was drawn about her like a cloak. None could speak to her for pity and fear. After what we had seen by the stream at noon, any one of us would have died in her place, but it was as though she were already drifting away, as though she were on the water and we on the shore. We stood near her and she spoke to us, yet we were separated from her. She spoke and we were silent. Then, as she ordered, I gave her the box of Theltokarna, and she walked up to Lord Shardick as though he were a sleeping ox. She cut him with a knife and mingled with Theltokarna with his blood, and then, as he woke in anger, she stood before him yet again, with no more fear than she had shown at noon, and he clutched her so she died. The girl looked about her. Where's the Tukinda? Get the long ropes on the cage, said Kelderek to Baltus, and set every man to draw it. Yes, and every woman, too, except for those who carry torches. There is no time to be lost. Even now we may be too late to reach Lord Tuckleminion. Less than three hours later, the enormous bulk of Shardick, the head protected by a hood made from cloaks roughly stitched together, had been dragged with ropes down the slope and up a hastily piled ramp of earth, stones, and planks into the cage. The last bars had been hammered into place, and the cage, hauled in front and pushed behind, was rocking and jolting slowly up the valley towards Gelt. Gelt Ethlin, Chapter 20 of Shardick by Richard Adams It could surely be no more than a day, two days at the most, thought Gelt Ethlin, to the breaking of the rains. For hours the thundery weather had been growing more and more oppressive, while rising gusts of warm wind set the dust swirling over the Becklin Plain. Santilacare Ketlis, commander of the Northern Army of Patrol, being taken sick with the heat, had left the column two days previously, returning to the capital by the direct road south, and entrusting Gel Ethlin, his second-in-command, with the task of completing the army's march to Cabin of the Waters, down through Tanilda, and thence westward to Bekla itself. This would be a straightforward business a fortification to be repaired here, a few taxes to be collected there, perhaps a dispute or two to be settled, and, of course, the reports to be heard of local spies and agents. None of these matters was likely to be urgent, and, since the army was already a day or two behind time for its return to Bekla, Santal Kitlis had told Galethlin to break off as soon as the rains began in earnest, and then take the most direct route back from wherever he happened to find himself. And high time, too, thought Gil Ethlin, standing beside his command banner with the falcon emblem, to watch the column go past. They've marched enough. Half of them are in no sort of condition. The sooner they get back to rain season quarters, the better. If the stagnant water fever hit them now, they'd go down in cursing rows. He looked northward, where the plain met the foothills rising to the steep, precipitous ridges above Gilt. The skyline, dark and threatening, with cloud hiding the summits, appeared to Gel Ethlin full of promise, the promise of early relief. With luck, their business could be decently cut short in Cabin, and one forced march, with the brains and the prospect of homecoming to spur them on, would see them safely in Bekla within a couple of days. The two Becklin armies of patrol, the northern and the southern, customarily remained in the field throughout the summer, when the risk was greatest of rebellion, or, conceivably, of attack from a neighboring country. Each army completed, twice, a roughly semicircular march of about 200 miles along the frontiers. Sometimes detachments saw action against bandits or raiders, and occasionally the force might be ordered to make a punitive raid across a border to demonstrate that Bekla had teeth and could bite. But for the most part it was routine stuff, training and maneuvers, intelligence work, tax collection, escorting envoys or trade caravans, road and bridge mending, and most important of all, simply letting themselves be seen by those who feared them only less than they feared invasion and anarchy. Upon the onset of the rains, the northern army returned to winter in Bekla, while the southern took up its quarters in Ikat Yeldeshe, sixty miles to the south. The following summer, the roles of the armies were reversed. No doubt the southern army was already back in Ikat, thought Gelethlin enviously. The southern army had the easier task of the two. Their route of march was less exhausting, and the dry season was less trying a hundred miles to the south. Nor was it only a question of work and conditions. Although Bekla was, of course, a city beyond compare, he himself had found last winter an excellent reason 
in fact, for a soldier, a most time-honored and attractive, if somewhat expensive, reason for preferring a cat yeldeshe. The Tenilden contingent, a particularly sorry-looking lot, were marching past now, and Galethlin called their captain out to explain why the men looked dirty and their weapons ill-cared for. The captain began his explanation, something about having had the command wished on him two days ago in place of an officer ordered to return with Santalcair Ketlis, and while he continued, Galethlin, as was often his way, looked him sternly in the eye while thinking about something completely different. At least this summer they had not had to go traipsing over the hills of Gelt and into the backwoods. Once, several years ago, when he was still a junior commander, he had served on an expedition to the south bank of the Telthirna, and a dismal, uncomfortable business it had been, camping among the gloomy forests, or commandeering flea-ridden quarters from some half-savage tribe of islanders, living like frogs in the river mists. Fortunately, the practice of sending Beckland troops as far as the Telthirna had almost ceased since their intelligence reports from the island. What the devil was it called? Atilga, Catalga, had become so regular and reliable. One of the less ape-like barons was secretly in the pay of Bekla, and apparently the high baron himself was not adverse to a little diplomatic bribery, provided a show was made of respecting his dignity and position, such as they were. During the recent summer marches, Santilcair Ketlis had received two reports from this place. The first, duly passed on to headquarters at Bekla, had resulted in instructions being returned to the army that once again there was no need to send troops into inhospitable country so far afield. It had, in fact, contained nothing worse than news of an exceptionally widespread forest fire that had laid waste the further bank of the Telthirna. The second report had included some tale of a new tribal cult which it was feared might boil over into fanaticism, though the high barons seemed confident of keeping it under control. Bekla's reactions to the second report had not yet found their way back to the northern army, but anyway, thank God, it was now too late in the season to think of sending even a patrol over the hills of Gelt. The rains were coming any day, any hour. The officer had finished speaking and was now looking at him in silence. Galethlin frowned, gave a contemptuous snort, suggesting that he had never heard such unconvincing nonsense in his life, and said he would inspect the contingent himself next morning. The officer saluted and went off to rejoin the men. At this moment, a messenger arrived from the governor of Cabin, sixteen miles to the east. The governor sent word that he was worried lest the rains should begin and the army withdraw to Bekla before reaching him. During the past ten or twelve days, the level of the Cabin reservoir, from which water was brought by canal sixty miles to Bekla, had sunk until the lower walls had become exposed and a section had cracked in the heat. If a disaster were to be prevented, the repair work ought to be carried out at once, before the rains raised the level again, but to complete the job in a matter of a day or two was beyond local resources. Galethlin could recognize an emergency when he was faced with one. He sent at once for his most reliable senior officer, and also for a certain Captain Hanglat, a foreigner from Terkinald, who knew more than anyone in the army about bridges, dams, and soil movement. As soon as they appeared, he told them what had happened and gave them a free hand to select the fittest troops, up to half the total strength, for a forced march to Cabin that night. As soon as possible after getting there, they were to make a start on repairing the reservoir. He himself, with the rest of the men, would join them before evening of the following day. By late afternoon they were gone, the soldiers grumbling, but at least not mutinous. There was a good deal of limping, and their pace was slow. Still, that was less worrying than the thought of the probable condition they would be in when they got to Cabin. Presumably, however, Hanglat would need a few hours to survey the reservoir and decide what needed to be done, and this in itself would give them some rest. At any rate, he, Galethlin, could hardly be criticized by headquarters in Bekla for the way he had gone about the matter. As night fell, he went the rounds of the sentries and bivouacs, a shorter task than usual, with his command down to half-strength, heard the casualty reports, and authorized a handful of genuinely sick men to be sent back to Bekla by Oxcart, ate his supper, played three games of worry with his staff captain, at which he lost fifteen meld, and went to bed. The following morning he was up so early that he had the satisfaction of rousing some of his officers in person, but the low spirits of the men gave him much less satisfaction. 
the news had got round that they were in for not only a forced march to come in, rains or no rains, but also for plenty of work when they got there. Even the best troops are apt to take it hard when ordered to do something arduous, after having been led to believe that their work is virtually finished, and Galethlin had deliberately retained his second best. Himself, a sturdy, energetic man, staunch in adversity, he could hardly contain his annoyance at the stupidity of the soldiers in being unable to realize the serious nature of the news from Cabin. It was only with difficulty that three or four of his senior officers were able to convince him that it was hardly to be expected that they would. "'It's a curious thing, sir,' said Capera, a leathery fifty-five-year-old who had survived a lifetime's campaigning and prudently turned all the loot that had stuck to his fingers into farmland on the borders of Sarkid. "'It's always struck me as a curious thing that when you're asking men to give a little extra, the amount they're genuinely able to give depends on the reason. If it's defending their homes, for instance, or fighting for what they believe is theirs by right, they'll find themselves able to do almost anything.' In fact, if it's a matter of any sort of fighting, they're nearly always able to give a good deal. They can understand that, you see, and no one wants his mates to think he's a coward or that he dropped out while they went on. Those kinds of thoughts are like keys to a secret armory. A man doesn't know what he's got inside until a key opens it. But to repair the reservoir at Cabin, no, they can't grasp the importance of that, so it's a key that doesn't fit the lock. It's not won't, sir, it's can't, you know. The camp had been struck. The columns were drawn up ready to march, and the pickets, who had been fed and inspected at their posts, were being called in last of all, when the guard commander brought in a limping, blood-stained hillman. He was little more than a boy, open-mouthed and wide-eyed, staring about him and continually raising one hand to his mouth as he licked the bleeding gash across his knuckles. Two soldiers had him under the armpits, or he might well have turned tail. "'Refugee, sir!' said the guard commander, saluting Bekla fashion with his right forearm across his chest. From the hills, talking about some sort of trouble at Gelt, sir, and as near as I can make him out. Can't stop for that sort of thing now, guard commander, said Gelethlin. Turn the fellow loose and get your men fallen in. Released by the soldiers, the hillman at once fell on his knees in front of Capra, whom he probably took for the senior officer present. He had babbled a few words in broken Becklin, something about bad men and fire, when Capra stopped him by speaking to him in his own language. There followed a swift dialogue of question and answer, so incisive and urgent that Galethlin thought it better not to interrupt. Finally, Capra turned to him. "'I think we'd better get the whole story out of this man before we set off for Cabin, sir,' he said. "'He keeps saying Gelt's been taken and burned by an invading army, and will have it that they're on their way down here.' Galethlin threw out his hands with a questioning look of mock forbearance, and the other officers, who did not particularly like Capra, smiled syntophantically. "'You know what we're up against at Cabin, Capra. This is hardly the time,' he broke off and began again. "'Some terrified peasant lad from the hills who'll say anything.' "'Well, that's just it, sir. He's not a peasant lad. He's the chief's son. Run for his life, it seems. Says the chief's been murdered by fanatics in some religious war they've started.' "'How do we know he's the chief's son?' "'By the tattooing on his arm, sir. "'He'd never dare to have that done just to deceive people. "'Where are these invaders supposed to have come from?' "'From Ortelga, sir,' he says. "'From Ortelga,' said Gil Ethlin. "'But at that rate we should have heard.' "'Capra said nothing, and Gil Ethlin thought the problem over quickly. "'It was an awkward one. "'In spite of there having been no recent report from Ortelga, "'it was just possible that some sort of tribal raid "'really was going to be made on the Beckland Plain.' If it took place after he had marched away to Cabin, ignoring a tribesman's warning uttered in the hearing of his senior officers, and if lives were lost, he broke off this train of thought and started another. If the great reservoir were breached and ruined in the rains for lack of an adequate labor force, after he had marched away towards Gelt on the strength of a hysterical report made by a native youth in the hearing of his senior officers, he stopped again. They were all looking at him and waiting. "'Bring that boy to the shed over there,' said Galethlin. "'Let the men fall out, but see that they stay in their companies.' Half an hour later, he concluded that the story was one that he could not ignore. Washed and fed, the youth had recovered himself, and spoke with restraint and dignity of his own loss, and with consistency of the danger that was threatening. It was a curious and yet convincing tale. An enormous bear, he said, had appeared on Ortelga.' 
probably fugitive from the fire beyond the Telferna. Its appearance was believed by the islanders to herald the fulfillment of a prophecy that Bekla would one day fall to an invincible army from the island, and had started a rising, led by a young baron, in which the previous ruler and certain others had been either killed or driven out. Galethlin perceived that this, if true, would account for the failure of the Becklin army's normal flow of intelligence. Yesterday afternoon, the youth continued, the Ortelgans had suddenly appeared in Gelt, set it on fire, and murdered the chief before he could organize any defense of the town. Fanatical and undisciplined, they had swept through the place and apparently subdued the townspeople altogether. Several of the latter, their homes and means of livelihood destroyed, had actually joined the Ortelgans for what they could get. Surely, said the young man, there could never have been men more eager than the Ortelgans to go upon their ruin. They believed that the bear was the incarnation of the power of God, that it was marching with them invisibly night and day, that it could appear and disappear at will, and that it would in due course destroy their enemies as fire burns stubble. On the orders of their young leader, who was evidently both brave and able but appeared to be ill, they had thrown a ring of sentries round Gelt to prevent any news getting out. The youth, however, had climbed down a sheer precipice by night, escaping with no more than a badly gashed hand, and then, knowing the passes well, had come over the twenty miles during the six hours of darkness and daybreak. "'What a nuisance,' said Galathlin. "'Which way does he think they're likely to come, and when?' The young man apparently thought it was certain that they would come by the most direct route and as quickly as they could. Indeed, it was probable that they had already started.' Setting aside their eagerness to fight, they had little food with them, for there was virtually none to be commandeered in guilt. They would have to fight soon, or be forced to disperse for supplies. Galethlin nodded. This agreed with all his own experience of rebels and peasant irregulars. Either they fought at once, or else they fell to pieces. "'They don't sound likely to get far, sir,' said Balaklesh, who commanded the Lepan contingent. Why not simply go on to Cabin and leave them to fall apart in the rains? As is often the way, the wrong advice immediately cleared Galethlin's mind and showed him what had to be done. No, that wouldn't do. They'd wander about for months, parties of brigands murdering and looting. No village would be safe, and in the end, another army would have to be sent to hunt them down. Do you all believe the boys telling no more than the truth? They nodded. Then we must destroy them at once, or the villages will be saying that a Becklin army fell down on its job and we must reach them before they get down to the hill road from Gelt and out onto the plain, partly to stop them looting, and partly because once they're on the plain, they may go anywhere. We might lose track of them altogether, and the men are in no state to go marching about in pursuit. There's even less time now to be lost than if we were going to come in. Capra, hang on to the lad. We'll need him as a guide. You'd all better go and tell your men that we've got to get to the hills by afternoon. Balaklesh, you take a hundred reliable spearmen and start at once. "'Find us a good defensive position in the foothills, send back a guide, "'and then push on and try to find out what the Ortelgans are doing.' "'Within an hour the sky had clouded over from one horizon to the other, "'and the west wind was blowing steadily. "'The red dust filled the soldiers' eyes, ears, and nostrils, "'and mingled grittily beneath their clothes with the sweat of their bodies. "'They marched with cloths or leather bound over their mouths and noses, continually screwing up their eyes, unable to see the hills ahead, each company following that in front through the thick helter-skelter of dust which piled itself like snow along the windward sides of rocks, of banks, and of the few sparse trees and huts along the way, and of men. It got into the rations and even into the wineskins. Galethlin marched behind the column on the leeward flank, whence he could check the stragglers and keep them in some sort of order. After two hours he called a halt and reformed the column in echelon, so that when they set out again each company was marching downwind of that immediately behind it. This, however, did little to relieve their discomfort, which was due less to the dust they raised themselves than to the storm blowing over the whole plain. Their pace diminished, and it was not until a good three hours after noon that the leading company reached the edge of the plain and, having reconnoitred half a mile in either direction, found the road to Gelt, where it wound up through the myrtle and cypress groves on the lower slopes. About a thousand feet above the plain the road reached a level green spot where the ghost of a waterfall trickled down into a rock pool, and here, as they came up, the successive companies fell out, drank, and lay down in the grass. 
Looking back, they could see the dust storm on the plain below, and their spirits rose to think that at least one misery was left behind. Gelethlin, grudging the delay, urged his officers to get them on their feet again. The afternoon had set in dark, and the wind over the plain was dropping. They stumbled on wearily, their footsteps, the clink of their arms, and the occasional shouts of orders echoing from the crags about them. It was not long before they came to a narrow gorge, where two officers of the advance party were awaiting them. Balaklesh, the officers reported, had found an excellent defensive position about a mile further up the road, beyond the mouth of the gorge, and his scouts had been out ahead of it for more than an hour. Galethlin went forward to meet him and see the position for himself. It was very much the sort of thing he had in mind, an upland plateau about half a mile wide, with certain features favorable to disciplined troops able to keep ranks and stand their ground. Ahead, to the north, the road came curving steeply downhill. The road came curving steeply downhill round a wooded shoulder. On the right flank was thick forest, and on the left a ravine. Through this bottleneck the advancing enemy must needs come. At the foot of the shoulder the ground became open and rose gently among the scattered crags and bushes to a crest over which the road passed before entering the gorge. Balaklesh had chosen well. With the crags as natural defensive points and the slope in their favor, troops in position would take a great deal of dislodging and it would be extremely difficult for the enemy to fight their way as far as the crest. Yet, unless they did so, they could not hope to pursue their march down to the plain. Galethlin drew up his line on the open slope, with the road running at right angles through his center. There would be no need for his weary men to break ranks or advance until the enemy had shattered themselves against his front. Under the still thickening clouds, the lowest vapors of which were swirling close above them, they waited on through the clammy twilight afternoon. From time to time there were rolls of thunder, and once lightning struck in the ravine half a mile away, leaving a long red streak like a wheel down the grey rock. Somehow the men had got wind of the magic bear. The Yeldashe spearmen had already produced a doggerel ballad about its hyperbolical and increasingly ribald exploits, while up the other end of the line some regimental buffoon seized his chance, capering and growling in an old oxhide, with arrowheads for claws on his fingers' ends. At last, Galethlin, from his command post on the road halfway down the slope, caught sight of the scouts returning down the hill among the trees. Balaklesh, running, reached him quickly. They had, he reported, come very suddenly upon the Ortelgans, who were advancing so fast that they themselves, already tired, had barely been able to get back ahead of them. As he spoke, Gel Ethlin and those about him could hear, from the woods above, the growing hubbub and clatter of the approaching rabble. With a last word about the supreme importance of not breaking ranks until ordered, he dismissed his officers to their posts. Waiting, he heard drops of rain beating on his helmet, but at first could feel none on his outstretched hand. Then, filling all the distance, an undulating gauze of rain came billowing over the edge of the ravine from the left. A moment later, the view below became blurred, and a kind of growling sigh rose from the lines of soldiers on either side. Galethlin took half a dozen steps forward, as though to see better through the moving mist of rain. As he did so, a band of shaggy-haired men, half-savage in appearance, and carrying various weapons, came tramping together round the curve of the road below, and stopped dead at the sight of the Becklin army confronting them.